With the Oscars just recently taken place, think of this talk as the latest fashion. Long enough to cover the topic, but short enough to make it interesting. So now, our family history begins in England, where both of my parents were born. Francis Robert Minter, my father, was born on February 23, 1896, at Huntington, Suffolk, England. Flora May Mint Haddingham, mum, was born on July 1, 1909, St. Cross, Suffolk, England. So my mum was born on my sister's birth. My sister was born on my mum's birthday, but she passed away on mine. Now, um, in the blue folder, which Don's looking at, is a record of my relatives in England. There are pictures of my grandparents on both sides of our family. Dad's parents, Elizabeth and Robert Minter, had a general store. And um, one of the things they sold was oil. But it wasn't like, from what I understand, three grades of oil. They just had three different prices, one for the poor, one for the middle class, and one for the rich. Um, <laughs> Now, what was it? Oh, Mum's parents owned um, a large, um, over a thousand acre farm, and um, they lived at Milton Hall. And there's a book on Milton Hall with 700 year history of her family home, and it's actually really interesting. Dave and I got to travel to England, and one of the things in that home is a hound's gate. So when they went on a fox hunt, um, it's a solid oak um, gate going up to the stairway. And the stairwell was solid oak from one of the ships, because they're real Tudor houses. They're made with shipwreck. They're not made to, like a house with flat boards like we have, right? They're real Tudor houses. And um, the hound's gate was interesting, because the, the foxes wouldn't scratch any of the furniture, because the top bar just moved around when the hounds came in and scratched. And anyways, the, the record, it's worth looking at the book. So, my na the name Minter is an English pre-7th century occupational name for a moneyer deriving from mint, a coin. The name Minter, M-Y-N-T-E-R-E, -E, was originally given to the workmen who stamped coins and later to the supervisors of the mint. Important members of society had their names printed on the coins they were responsible for producing. In the records, there are various spellings of our surname, including Mintor, M-I-N-T-O-R, Minter, M-Y-N-T-E-R, Mintar, M-I-N-T-A-R, Minto, M-I-N-T-O. And surnames became necessary when governments introduced personal taxation. The first recorded spellings of our family name is that of William in the Fleet of Fines in Essex. And in 1584, on February 22nd, John Minter and Margaret Mulcaster were married. Um, are they related? I'm not sure. But my brother, who's done a lot of work on ge um, genealogy, he says that we were. So if you want to find out about your name, um, go to www.surname.com. And it has all the history of names and records. It's really interesting. Just one more footnote. You might not be interested in this, but there are approximately 2,880 people named Minter in the UK. That makes it the 3,376 most common surname overall. Out of every million people in the UK, approximately 46 are named Minter. There you have it, more facts for a trivia pursuit game. <laughs> my father, along with six of my aunts and uncles, uh, two of my aunts actually, fought in uh, or were nurses in World War I. And last fall on November 10th, I told you about some of my dad's stories. So I'm not going to repeat those. But um, one of the battles my father told me about was the Battle of Somme. And although the general was warned the barb, barbed wire had not been cut in no man's land, the men were still sent in. It was a butcher shop in hell. It was the single bloodiest battle in British history. There were 60,000 casualties on the first day. Another battle Dad mentioned was the Battle of Passchendaele. The battalion Dad went in 
at midnight on August 15, 1917, and with 950 men strong. They were relieved at midnight August 16th with only 128 men left. And like all Imperial soldiers, they were paid a shilling, the equivalent of about 25 cents a day. Uncle Arthur was killed in the war, leaving a wife and two small children. Dad's father had also died suddenly. After losing his father and brother, Dad made a promise to himself that if he ever got out of the war alive, he would emigrate to Canada. Dad kept his promise and moved to Alberta for a fresh start. Dad worked and farmed at Gilt Hedge, Alberta for the next 14 years. In 1934, when the Depression was almost over, Dad returned to England for a long holiday. In the Wainwright Star, this note appeared in the November 7, 1934 issue. Mr. Frank Minter is leaving at the end of the week to spend the winter in the old country. He sails from Montreal on November 22nd, and his friends are wondering if he will return still single. Speaking of the Wainwright Star, this is their version of Facebook, dated August 18th, 1937. And um, so August 18th, um, if you have ever died, moved, eloped, sold out, been shot, been born, had a baby, caught cold, been gypped, been robbed, been visiting, bought a car, had complaint, been married, been courting, been arrested, lost your hair, gone bug house, stole anything, sold your hogs, been in a fight, gone to church, cut a new tooth, had an operation, been snake bitten, or playing anything at all during 1937, phone the Rainwright Star. We want the news. <laughs> now, where was I? Well, my fa to get back to that note about Dad going back to England. Well, my father didn't return single. On March the 27th, 1935, he married Mum, Flora May Haddingham. Dad and Mum left England on March the 29th and arrived in Wainwright on August 9th. Dad's brother, Uncle Len, met Dad and Mum at the station and their life in Canada began. I don't remember much about living in Alberta. Only stories I've been told, because we left when I was one. Seven of us were born in Wainwright. Fran, Rob, Marg, Doris, Herb, Phil, and myself. Mike, the youngest, was born in Victoria. One of the stories is the day Fran helped Dad by putting water in the pump in minus 20 degree weather. Apparently, it took Dad and Uncle Len until 4 a.m. to take the pump apart, clean it, and put it back together. Dad spent some time explaining to Uncle Len that he shouldn't be upset because she's just little and was only trying to help. But that was Fran, always willing to do, her sh do more than her share. Another story Mum told me was concerning Johnny, and Johnny was our horse. All of us rode Johnny. When Mum said I had just started walking and knew a few words, I wandered from the house and went to visit Johnny. Mum said she looked out and in a panic ran to find me behind Johnny with my arms around one of his hind legs. And Mum grabbed and asked, what are you doing? I looked up and said, loving Johnny. <laughs> Mum and Dad had promised her parents they would return to England, but World War II broke out and England was in ruins. My grandparents advised against it. Instead, we moved on October 7, 1946, from Wainwright to Elk Lake. And Dad had already come out earlier and bought the poultry farm. And there's a picture of our farm in our house over there. Um, at oh, sorry. Okay, I'm just not used, okay. At 50, Dad came to Elk Lake and started all over again. And most of us are thinking about retiring, but not my father. So, um, our address was 5126 Pat Bay Highway, and as Don Fisht explained, our property was expropriated by the Highways and Parks Department in 1970. 
The road leading to the National Rowing Center was part of our farm. Life at Elk Lake was full with many hardworking and memorable days. We sold eggs, corn, and lots of other vegetables, as well as fruits and berries at a fair price. It was our version of a farmer's market. People came by the dozens, especially on the weekends. When the corn was ready, ready, that's when it really got busy. Even today, I've met people who tell us that our eggs and corn were the best. Speaking of the best, our family enjoyed the challenge of competing at Sanichton Fair, and Mum looked after the eggs. She was really satisfied with her efforts when she won every first-class ribbon and every grand prize for the egg division, and that often happened, clean sweet. Mum was also an avid reader. She started her day reading the morning paper. She read magazines and novels by the dozen. Her book might be propped up in the kitchen, and she would be cooking with her free hand. Perhaps it was because of the amount she read that she had a way of getting to the crux of the matter and putting things in simplistic terms. One of my favorite stories is the egg story. I was about 12, and my job was to put the eggs on the trays as they came off the grater. So I'm putting these eggs, large here, medium, minding my own business. Then one of my school teachers comes in, and I won't tell his name, um, came in and he said, he demanded, I want cracked eggs. Oh, I shouldn't bound, I guess. <laughs> uh, I want cracked eggs. So my mom politely said, I'm sorry, we're all sold out. We have no cracked eggs today. And Never did I enjoy my job more, because I knew where this might end. So, you will just have to purchase great eggs today, Mom suggested. No, I've come for cracked eggs, and 25 cents a dozen's all I'm going to pay. So, anyways, this went back and forth. The conversation went back and forth. Mom was becoming less patient, but the teacher was becoming more demanding. So, finally, Mom reached her limit. She said, if it's cracked eggs you want, cracked eggs you're going to get. Smack, 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 smack. <laughs> and he picks the carton up, and it's dripping with eggs, and I'm still grading those. <laughs> Anyways, that was one lesson that Mum taught that teacher he'll never forget. <laughs> Mum was also the queen of recycling, before recycling was ever invented. Waste not, want not. And woolen sweaters and socks and anything wool went, they shipped it off somewhere. I have no idea. Maybe you people did the same thing. And it came back as floor mats. And those floor mats are still used today. They, they're, they were wool, and they, I'm sure somebody's got them in some house. Um, the other thing we did was I've never, ever uh, known anybody to throw scraps unless it went into a compost. So I've never, ever put food scraps into the garbage. They always go into a compost, because that's what we always did. So, and the third one was the go when they, um, we would have a goose for Christmas as well as a turkey. And the goose down was always dried, washed, dried, and made into pillows. So we had goose down pillows every year, and they were the most comfortable pillows. Um, so we recycled a lot, and you learned to do that. When the Minters arrived, also, the enrollment of Royal Oak and Cordova Bay schools skyrocketed. <laughs> Fran, Rob, and Marg attended the tiny Royal Oak School, which is now a cafe of some sort. And I have the uh, copy for the, that first register with their names on it from the school. Um, later, we all attended Cordova Bay, which opened with 86 students, grade 1 to 6, who shared a building with unfinished floors and outdoor plumbing. And there was one year when Mike was in grade one and Fran was in grade 12, leaving only four grades without a mentor. It was during that year, McGavin's bread delivered 25 loaves of bread to our house every week. The driver once told me that he delivered more bread to our house than he did to the restaurant at Elk Lake. When you grow up in a large family, it is like being part of a community. Everyone had responsibility, and we all did our share. We knew what we had to do, and without being told, you did it. The idea was to get your chores done as soon as possible and head to the lake for a swim. It was the time when Elk Lake was Victoria's playground, and if you didn't get there early, you didn't get the best spot. 
We spent endless hours swimming at the lake. Sadly, I haven't swam in the lake for years because now there's more geese than people and the water is no longer crystal clear. When we were growing up, it was a time when people didn't lock their doors and when parents didn't worry about us heading out on our own. All of us belongs to sports teams. It was a time when honesty was the best policy. I, as far as I'm concerned, it was a really good time to be a teenager. Fran was the oldest. Fran's crown of white hair and her distinctive laugh welcomed neighbors who came to purchase eggs and vegetables at her farm on Santa Clara too. On January 20th of this year, Fran peacefully passed away. Um, and I, I just want to read um, what I read uh, uh, for her eulogy at her funeral. Frances Evelyn Savage, although your body stayed a while and didn't really know, your body went on living, but your struggle we all know. That's why some may have said goodbye to the person that was you. But today, when we remember, we'll think of all the best your flowers, vegetables, and eggs, which passed the neighbor's test. Girl guides, the ballpark, and Saanich Fair, where your laughter filled the air. We'll concentrate on friends on Santa Clara and remember how you cared. And in the real scheme of things, your illness wasn't long. We think of you as yesterday, when you were fit and strong. Sorry. And when we are asked about you, it's those things we will send, about a mother, a grandmother, great-grandmother, sister and aunt, hardworking and devoted to the end. And so we are here today to pay our last respects to you, to say you will be missed, friend, and we all love you. Rob, Rob was the, um, was the one who was always constructing something. He took engineering at UBC, and his final position was supervisor of construction and maintenance for school district 61. He was born on July 30th, uh, ju sorry, July 30th, 1937, and he passed away in 2005 after a battle of cancer. What I remember about Rob most is designing a pea sheller when he was 50, about 15 years old. He, he created this device that had a drum with paddles inside and it smacked the peas and the peas went down into a drawer and then we had a long um, kind of belt, a conveyor belt. Do you remember that, Don? <laughs> and the peas went down and in no time you could have a whole melt belt full of peas. Neighbors from all over came to use that pea, pea shower. I thought it was pretty amazing and it still works. But somebody's, I think Mark has it now. So anyways, that's what I remembered. But the problem was we still had to pick pails and pails of peas before you could use the pea shower. Mark and Doris, like Fran, had careers in the bank. What I remember most is how they decorated our room. They cut movie stars out of magazines. Eva Gardner, uh, Elizabeth Taylor, um, Eddie Fisher, Rock Hudson, Debbie Reynolds, um, James Dean, all of them. And there were hundreds and hundreds of pictures. And then we had a slanted kind of room in, uh, in the bedroom, and they hung from the ceiling as well, all these layers, and everybody that came in couldn't believe the wallpaper job because it was movie star pictures. I mean, it was a kind of a history record. Uh, Herb was the most interested in farming. I remember an egg customer asking him how we were able to grow such wonderful tomatoes. Herb simply said, you need to use shit. <laughs> <laughs> Manure would have probably been a better courteous way, but the lady was a little shocked, but she certainly <laughs> understand what made the tomatoes grow. Herb went to the Vermilion School of Agriculture and Pam and Herb had a farm near the airport. There's another story about Herb we all remember. He always had, we always had a cow, and um, Dad would milk it in the morning, but the boys had to milk it at night. So unfortunately, that poor cow got milked at all hours, something you should never do if you have a cow, but it happened at our place. 
So Herb came home from a date one night, so it's pretty late, right? It's midnight or so. And um, he goes down to milk the cow, and he's minding his own business, flips on the lights, and turns around, and in the calf pen, there's this man crouched down. And it scared the living daylights out of him. I can he came screaming out of the barn. His face was beat right. I said, Herb, you had the pitchfork. You had the advantage. Oh, it scared me. It scared me. So anyways, the guy took off. Herb scared the living daylights on him. But there's another story to this story. Mom was talking to Don and Nori Spencer's mom. And Mrs. Spencer told mom that, her, that they heard some snoring under their bedroom window. And the man that Mrs. Spencer described and the one that Herb had an encounter with was the same person. So I guess he made the rounds. Maybe he stayed at your place sometime and didn't even know it. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I guess um, and now, Phil was number six in our family ranking. Phil took engineering at BCIT and owned and ran a very su successful roofing and waterproofing company in Vancouver. Phil and Leslie are retired. This is the story of the 1948 panel van. And this involved Herb and Phil. So Herb was 13, 15 and Phil was 13. Not old enough to drive a car. Not old enough to have a vehicle registered in your name. But somehow, these innocent young men had Speedway Motors into selling them this 48 panel. Because they wanted to buy a pickup truck, but found out a pickup was way too expensive because they made their money by um, selling corn. So they got all the money off the corn. It was a 45-45 split between them. And Mike got 10% of sales. But Mike says some days he got the 10%, some days he didn't. So anyways, they wanted this pickup truck. So Dad, Dad was mad. Oh, he was so mad. But he, he's, they, so Dad registered in their name and got this panel, 48 panel thing back to the house. Then. Dad says, well, this is ridiculous. Well, we're going to make it into a pickup. So somehow they got it down to Gary Cuttinghouse and got Gary to weld it and cut it off to make this pickup truck. But the story of the pickup truck was it kind of upset father. You never argued with my dad. So anyways, the truck never did get finished, but they did learn to drive it because everybody learned to drive on the pasture, right? You go down to the pasture and you drive. Like, I learned to drive by taking Dad's station wagon down and saying I was going to go pick up the hay because that was an excuse. I was going to work, you get to drive the car. So anyways, the boys never did finish their pickup. It sat behind the barn for years until it got towed away. But that was the story Phil remembered about how creative they were. Now, um, oh, it was probably around 1958. Dad said he would never get a TV while we were in school. Dad felt we would not read or spend as much time on our homework or schoolwork. That was before Ripple Rock was going to be blasted. Mike said we got a TV three days before Ripple Rock. Rob carried the TV up to Mum and Dad's room and somehow attached wires to somewhere and they got the thing going and he said that Rob, Doris and Mike watched Old Yeller. I don't remember any of this but that's what he said. Then Dad came up to go to bed. Mike got in trouble um, because he was way, way too late. And the next day, the TV was moved downstairs in time for us all to watch um, the blasting of Ripple Rock. That's how we got TV. But we still had to keep up with our schoolwork. By the time I was at UVic, Mike and I were the only ones left. Our parents were also getting older. I did lots of the cooking, cleaning, and canning, and Mike was the one who was left to do the egg chores, and we had 20,000 chickens. There's a lot of eggs. It was a busy and exhausting time for all of us. It was a challenge to do your chores, keep up with university while balancing a social life. One thing I clearly remember was the day Mike was trying to catch up on sleep. His friends, Jerry Spencer and Mark Stuthers, came to visit. But before I woke him up, he was lying on the Chesterfield. I got the brightest red lipstick I could find, and I put it on his lips, and it wasn't even put on property. It was all smeared, right? So he gets up, not knowing I had done the damage, and he walks in, and Jerry and Mark just killed themselves laughing. And Mike turned around without saying a word, and he said, I'm going to kill you. What did you do now? Like, as if I was in trouble. Anyways... 
Um, another day, um, after Christmas, it was really windy. So Mike and I got the idea it would be a good time to take Rob's sailboat out on the lake. Well, we didn't know much about sailing, and the wind got up. <laughs> it gets quite choppy out there. In no time, we capsized. So, and also, Mum and Dad had bought me this really nice coat for Christmas, and I was wearing it. And no way was I going to let my coat go to the bottom of the lake. So we swam from, it was quite a ways out. We, we swam in, and this man, the police somehow got there. Somebody had called in, the police are on shore. And this man stripped to his shorts coming in to save us. And we we're saying, we're fine, we're fine, we'll be in, we'll be in, right? So we made it in. And then I, somehow Mark Stethers got down there too. So he, Mark Stethers somehow found a phone and phoned and got 10, 10 bucks from CJVI, News of the Hour. <laughs> and, our, and we were trying to do it without Rob knowing we had taken his boat without doing it. But here we were soaking wet and the boat's going on the other side of the lake. But anyways, we got the boat at the, uh, the boat ramp. Obviously a good place to find a boat, right? And we got it home, but we had to tell Rob, we took your boat without asking, and sorry we capsized it, but it's all okay. That was fine. Um, Ten bucks he got for that. After Dad and Mum's property was expropriated, an unfair and unbalanced system as far as I'm concerned, um, by, by the Highway and Parks Department, Dad and Mum moved to Boker near Beach Drive in Oak Bay, where they enjoyed a well-deserved retirement. Mum often wanted to return to the farm, especially in the spring. Mum would pick the flowers. I suggested per perhaps you shouldn't be picking flowers out of the park. It's not your land anymore. Mum said, I don't care. I planted them and I will pick them. They got our land and they're not going to get my flowers. <laughs> So that's what I think of when I see those daffodils and things growing there. One day I didn't have, oh, that's a story about the bread. One day I didn't have any bread, so I made some buns and used a recipe from St. Michael's cookbook. I found one and knew I had everything required. I made the recipe and they turned out fine. So, I thought I should check. Um, whose recipe it was, and it was Flora Mae Minter, my mom's. Had no idea that she had put that recipe in. Um, and that's why I made the egg sandwiches in memory of our farm for my mom and for the 25 loaves of bread. So here, um, there's lots more Minter stories, but here ends the lesson for today. Thank you for coming and listening to me. So that's it. Oh, now I'll just tell you about some of these pictures. This is the boat Mum and Dad came on. It was the Duchess of Bedford when they came. And this is, I'm not going to pass this book around. I don't want anyone to get a hernia. But it's, it's um, the story. Of this them. is Milton Hall. This is my mom's family home. It's 700 years history of her home. And Where's that townscape? It's in here. Anyway, these are the people. These are the people that bought the house. It was my grandparents had the house, and then my aunt and uncle. And these are the people that done now. And these are notes from my cousin in England. She's made some corrections that were in the book. So I don't know if anybody wants to see these. I'll pass them to the friends. That's the register. <laughs> and this is my mom and dad for their um, 25th anniversary, they went back to Milton Hall. This is taken in front of Milton Hall for the book. And this is our family home. This is our family home that's taken down to make way for a park. But actually, um, they, they kept all of the lumber because it was such good lumber without any knots or anything. Um, and the people took it apart board by board. Tell them about the stained glass windows. Oh, the stained glass windows, yeah. There were stained glass windows in the house, and before my dad, um, they took it, my dad gave everybody two stained glass windows. And our stained glass windows that Dave and I bought are at our cabin on Thetis Island. And this is our farm. So this is our farm, and this is the grove going to the growing pot. That, that would be part of the farm. This is Fleming, Spike Fleming that has that um, tree farm. 